program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. We have just got out on our sunset safari, a beautiful lilac breasted roller sitting up in the marula tree behind us and this is Safari Live. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Safari Live. My name is Byron and on camera with me this afternoon is Craig. Now some of you may have seen Tristan already. He did the pre-show drive with Fergus and then we've got Chantal and Alice in the final control. It's great to have all of you with us this afternoon. Don't forget we are completely live so please send us your questions and comments at hashtag Safari Live via Twitter. That's how you get hold of us and uh, we'll hopefully answer them and find some wildlife for you this afternoon. It's been a bit quiet however we did have an exciting morning Tristan had a beautiful big male leopard that he followed for quite some time so we're hoping that our luck continues this afternoon and we can find a big cat for you otherwise we'll see what else there is out there we also have our team that is up in the Masai Mara at the moment and hopefully they'll be joining us a little bit later and um, I think Brent might be on drive or Jamie I'm not sure who's there this afternoon who's going to be out um, but hopefully we have some exciting animals, new animals for some of you, up in the Masai Mara. And I'm actually now going to head down to our southern boundary. I had tracks of a female leopard just towards the end of drive this morning. And I'm going to go and see if we can find that leopard. Um, it's a bit of a, bit of a long shot. It's a beautiful, cool afternoon. It's about 23 degrees Celsius, or just over 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But um, we'll see what we can find. Now, while I do that, let's head over to Tristan, who would like to say good afternoon to you. Indeed we would. We're just having a little look at the puffy clouds that are starting to vanquish to the east as the cold front starts moving off, which is happy days because it means that there's no more wind and it's starting to warm up. Now, as Byron said, my name is Tristan and on camera today I've got Ferg with the bat cam and it promises to be a wonderful afternoon. Like I said, it's much warmer than what we've had over the last two days. In fact, Ferg is even rocking a t-shirt this afternoon, which means hopefully the animals will be out. Nice guns, Ferg. Byron's going to get jealous be careful and so our plan is for the afternoon is that there was a sort of report of lion tracks particularly a male lion sorry that was coming down towards Gallego they don't know if anybody found them we closed down before the guys finished tracking so I'm in this area now just trying to see if I can't find where those tracks went and where they go and we're gonna try and see if we can't find him failing that then it's back to our male leopard tracks that we had this morning and hopefully along the way there will be some big elephants out as well because I would love to see a bunch of Ellie's at one of the dams as well so it promises to be a really good afternoon and hopefully we will have lots of fun now remember this is an interactive experience so we love to hear from all of you hashtag safari live on Twitter for the new viewers and the rest of you well you know how it works and so we'd love to hear from you as well and if there was anything on dam cam during the day we'd love to know as well right Ferg let's get our eyes peeled and let's see if we can't find us some a masculine male we've already shown one male in his prime during our pre-show which was Byron so I feel like most of our work has been done but the cherry on the top would be a Birmingham male or a male leopard so let's try and see if we can't start getting our wits together and start concentrating a little bit. I see the tracks from the vehicles this morning came from this way so I'm just gonna follow the last tracks of the vehicle that was following up because they would have gone from this area back to the lodge and so if I follow their tracks from the lodge back to where they were hopefully I'll be able to pick up some sort of footprint for this male line and then can follow and see where it goes to. There was a lot of confusion this morning regarding male lines because there seemed like there was three different tracks that were being followed and no one really knew they belonged to and whether or not they were from the same individual. 
no tracks there and um, moved into different places but eventually it turned out that there was one that came in from Cheetah Plains and Koro into Torchwood and then came back into Juma and cut south of the Mulawati on the eastern side of the Mulawati and then two that were in Biffle's Hook that were making quite a bit of noise last night they then separated one went north and one came south so that's the last of what I got now I'm going to try and see if we can't find a little bit more of an indication of where these guys actually went and who they actually are. I'm pretty sure it's the Birmingham's though. It would make sense to me if it was. Right, now we're searching for the big apex predator and talking about apex animals. Byron Bicep Sorrel is still on his leopard search and let's get an update from him. <laughs> Tristan, uh, he's got far too much time on his hands, that man. Now we, we're busy looking for leopard, indeed we are. Um, I'm going to have a look in this area. There are some little water holes around here, so the possibility of this young female walking around and, and going to some of the water is quite good during the course of the day, but it's been a been quite a cool day. Alright, dear watcher, you asked if we could please see the geese and the goslings that are um, probably the ones at Chitra Dam. I think you would have seen them there. And we will head down there at some point. I'm going to check around this area first. I'm going to scan all these termite mounds. I'm going to look very, very carefully, but then we'll head down to Chitra Dam and maybe have some sightings of either. Well, I can basically guarantee hippo sightings maybe there's a crocodile out and maybe those Egyptian geese with the goslings I'm sure they'll be around there and these cool winter afternoons are wonderful now it's been cloudy the last two days very cloudy and cloudy and we had a little bit of rain as light drizzle very light drizzle yesterday but that's exciting because it's brought out some activity from animals that we probably wouldn't necessarily see um, that that frequently at the moment and um, so Monique this is linked to your question you wanted to know how how much rain we actually get here now the average rainfall is probably between 500 and 800 mils of rain in this part of South Africa, this area of the Greater Kruger. It's between there somewhere, maybe 600 to 800, I would say. Um, but very little rain in the winter. This is our dry season, so we don't get much rain. But we had a little bit of rain last night, not much. Literally a few drops, light drizzle. Now, um, what that did do, though, was it caused some animals to come out that we don't necessarily see that often. So we do see terrapins, but we don't see them out of the water very often. They're often always around the edge of the water holes or in the water. And we saw a serrated back terrapin yesterday. It was um, walking along the road probably from one water hole to the other. And then this morning what I got really excited about is we had tracks of an aardvark that had been moving around early this morning. And I think what happens occasionally is this rain. Oh, sorry, Craig just saw something. Was it a green pigeon, Craig? Uh, it just flew off. It was just an African green pigeon that was sitting in the tree above us. So as I was saying, the aardvark tracks are very exciting because what's happened is with a bit of rain that we've had, they may have got more active. It was a lot cooler. And also, they will then go and look for um, for potential food, termites especially, so that bit of rain and moisture might um, might uh, bring out some termites and that's why they're probably a little bit more active. Animals like aardvark and pangolin. So you never know, we could bump into one. And there's a dazzle of some animals. A dazzle of zebra. That's lovely. Now, this is great to see the zebra however this is the area that i was hoping that we get tracks of this female leopard now this female leopard or, or i think is it's a young female by the by the the tracks that i saw this morning it looked like a young female so i'm going to have a look if it is the young female i think it is um or any young female probably a little bit shy especially with big zebra moving around so she could be hiding somewhere in this area. There are some impala around here though. 
Now if the Impala are around, they're usually very alert and aware. So if there's sign of any leopard around, they'd probably alarm call. But we'll see. We'll see. Maybe she moved through the thicket somewhere and lay down and rested during the course of the day. Wonderful to see the zebra. Now they just actually very it's very calm and peaceful at the moment. I don't hear any birds calling. I just there's one Cape turtle dove. There's always one Cape turtle dove, isn't there? <laughs> calling behind us is that to work harder, work harder. But other than that, it's quite peaceful, quite very quiet. Oh, now this is interesting and I'm curious. Um, my guess, so Tristan says he's got another animal with different stripes. Now my guess would be an Inyala. Let's see what he's got. Uh, close Byron, but no cigar. Unfortunately, it's the larger of the family. It's a kudus that we have here. So there's a couple young male kudu. There you can see him with his beautiful twirled horns and there's actually two of them in this little group and then a couple of females that you'll also see bounding away from us at the moment and they seem to be a little bit sort of shy of us and I wonder if they haven't bumped into our male lion at some point in the day and that's why they're a little bit sort of nervous they keep looking around at us and listening and then they scattered off just now into that thicket and they're using that camouflage that they have perfectly by going in behind the trees you can see that that coloration blends so well and they just disappear as they move through so very 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 good at concealing themselves and that's why they do it as soon as a vehicle sees them they tend to do this and try and get behind something in order just to be able to hide and then watch us from there well, a nice start nonetheless though, even though they didn't stick around for long. Still nice to see. I always like seeing male kudu. They're one of my favorites. Particularly when you get those really big guys that have the massive horns that come out. They are very impressive. Now, there was at one point, I don't know if it's changed, but the record length for a set of kudu horns was six foot two. Now, that's like me standing on top of a kudu's head. Can you imagine me on top of a kudu's head? Two of me and angles like this. It would be quite entertaining, don't you think, Ferg? It would be crazy, but it would be entertaining too. I don't know if I'd want to be on top of a kudu's head though. I feel like many a branch would hit you in the face and it would all just be quite something to deal with. <laughs> also, I don't think I'd be very good at impaling anybody. Got a bit of a blunt head, so it's not going to work too well if I had to try and be pushed into something. It would just end up with me having a massive headache. Now, the, apparently the tracks for this male line headed in this direction and then went towards this torchwood tree so that's why I'm just driving so slowly here just trying to see where exactly these footprints went here's our kudu footprints kudu 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 where are you male lion hmm, no male lion there So, Riti, you're wondering if kudus have horns to be able to fight a lion or a leopard? Well, no, not really. The thing about lions and leopards is that they are very strong animals, and therefore fighting with them is going to be a bit of a futile exercise. You probably find there has been a few reported cases where those horns have impaled a lion or a leopard, and they can use them in desperate times, but generally most of these antelope species, as soon as they see a predator, are going to try and run away before anything else. They know turning and fighting can sometimes be just a complete waste of time, and they're going to get killed so they try and not do that as much as possible but if they get cornered in an area you will find a kudu will drop it sort of to its knees and sable actually are a big exponent of the sable antelope will often use their horns to try and push people away and there's a funny sort of um, what would you call it, a fact about sable, which we'll get into just now. And so kudu would probably do the same. They'll drop to their knees and they'll try and push away with those horns, but ultimately they're not going to be fast enough, and particularly in the case of lions, when there's multiple of them, they're really going to battle to try and keep those lions at bay by just using their horns. So they try and rather get away and try and jump and try to get sort of out of the way of the lions more than actually sit and fight with them. Now I was saying with the sables, 
that they readily will fight like that. And interestingly enough, the first animal to kill a person in the Greater Kruger National Park area was actually a sable. That's the first recorded case was a sable antelope that impaled somebody through the midriff, which must have been quite something because a sable antelope has big recurved horns. Actually, there's another kudu here, Ferg. You see that? Very sneaky. I didn't see him. Just underneath our torchwood tree, there's a kudu just ambling along through the bushes. There you can see him. But I don't see any sign of these male lion tracks. I wonder where they went from here. So the kudus have walked all up and down here, so it's actually quite difficult to see any real tracks. But I'll try and keep looking around. You can see how well the horns blend in there. It's amazing. It's perfect shape just for the environment that they spend time in. Those thickets, the shape just kind of blends to the, to the tree itself and it makes it almost impossible to see those kudu in amongst there, even as a male. There you can see a little female's ear poking through. And those ears are vitally important when it comes to this kudu surviving in areas like this with thick, dense bush. Very difficult to see lions. We know that the other day when we saw the Nkuhumas in this similar area, they were invisible from the road. You could not see them even though they were about 30 meters off the road. But they could hear if they moved or if they sneezed or anything like that. And those big ears on a kudu are going to be vitally important to stay alive in an area like this. So you'll find that they'll use them as much as possible to try and sort of determine what's going on around them. Ferg, I'm going to go forward a little bit because I think we'll have a better gap forward. Hmm, I wonder where these lion tracks went. They must be here somewhere. There's another big pathway coming up now. But there we go. You can see a curious little head poking over the bushes on my right hand side. Ferg, can you see? Are you right where you are? I'm sure you'll have a good mirror to the left. There it is. <laughs> so there you can see just watching us over the bush and there's those massive ears. Can you imagine how much sound those ears must capture? You can also see they've got lots of hairs in their ears. Now the theory is is that those hairs are able to channel sound deeper into the ear and therefore make it much better to hear with. So a very good way of hearing is to have those sort of big thick furry parts that channel everything in. Yes, we're talking about you. Look how it's smelling. Big, big, deep breaths of air, trying to just work out what's going on around us. Where are these animals? Is there a predator that could potentially be here? If a lion did walk here during the sort of early hours of this morning, there will be a scent that has been left behind, and therefore they'll know that they've picked up this, that there was something around at some point, and that will make them just a little bit more nervous, and that's why they'll take those deep breaths of air, just trying to work out what's going on. Now, hopefully, our male will also come out just like the female did. Isn't she beautiful? They're looking in great condition as well. In comparison to this time last year where the kudus were quite thin and emaciated, they really are looking a lot better than what they were. He's an impressive fella. Those are quite nice big horns. So you can see those have turned for their third time now. So generally with kudu, when they start reach, their horns start reaching and slowing right down in terms of a growth rate, they'll have turned for the third time and that one you can see is just starting that third twist now so it really is an impressive individual now you'll notice that they V out quite a bit as he's standing there and the reason why they V like that is so that when he goes through these thickets the horns ultimately are going to hit branches and so to be able to negotiate areas like this they V out so that he can lean back and you can still see over his muzzle but those horns will touch up against the back and that means that he can then kind of glide through here without getting caught up on branches and it makes it a lot easier for him to move. You'll also notice now that very big white stripe around the eyes or close to the eyes that's all there just to help bring light into the eye. So Shelly, you say so pretty. Well, I agree with you, Shelly. Kudu are one of the most beautiful animals we have out here. I really enjoy spending time watching them. Generally, we don't get to see too much of them because they tend to move into these thickets and they become quite tough to follow. So it's so nice that we've got a nice relaxed herd that is just moving slowly past us. And hopefully they're going to actually cross the road in front of us. I see they're slowly edging towards the road. So it looks like we might actually get them moving right in front of us and they're being very trusting of our presence. So Lewis, you're saying the hair in the ears also could act as a wind buffer 
Well, I would imagine it does play some part in that, although you'll find when it's very windy, much like what we saw yesterday, is most of our animals end up being in thick, deep bush. Much easier to get into drainage lines and into thickets where that, the trees are doing all the sort of breaking of the wind rather than having to rely on your ears. Because at the end of the day, if it did muffle sound, then it's going to make it more difficult for these guys to be able to actually detect predators. So they don't want to muffle sound as much as possible. They want to be able to hear as much as possible. And so in conditions where wind is bad, like you see with elephants, they'll start moving into thicker areas. Now I'm just gently trying to roll forward because I think there's one female just on the other side of this bush that I want to have a look at. But alas, the car won't go. There's this lion tracks here. So I found our male line tracks, they're right here, moving straight down this path to my right hand side. And this is amazing how you can use pathways in the bush, so that you can see there's a little path that's snaking through there, and that's where this male line has walked. In fact, I'm going to try and show you the footprint for this male line, because we did quite a bit of tracking on leopards this morning, and we saw sort of the size of leopards, but we'll have a look at our kudu just going across the road, because I don't want to scare her while, when I climb out the car. See how she's listening? So there's some ox pickers that are calling just ahead of us and she's just listening to those. There we go, everything's okay, you can cross the road. There we go. Isn't she beautiful? Very nice. And the sun's coming out, it's all happening. Right, Fig, let me reposition so you can get this male lion track. Fig, I'll jump out so that I can show you where it is because it's quite difficult to see. It's not the easiest of tracks to see. But here we go. So it's just on the edge of the road. There was a, would have been another one, but here is where it is. I'm just going to do a circle around it. Okay, and here you've got the back edge coming down with the three lobes that go around, and then the toes coming forward, coming forward here here and here. Now we know that this is a male lion because of the size of the print. If I put my hand next to it, you can see it's almost the same size as my hand. Very, very big. And the leopard print that we saw earlier, well this morning and that we were following, if I had to take a sort of different approach to it and use a bit of grass, you'd probably find that the male leopard track would be in there and would probably be, I mean this is just a guess in terms of size, but I'm going to try and show you roughly all. Oh, my piece of grass broke, oh no. So I'm going to have to build a little extra piece here. But in all likelihood, it would be somewhere around there. So that would be roughly the difference between the male leopard track, maybe a little bit larger. Sorry, I've ruined it a little bit. But maybe a bit larger like that would be the size of the leopard track in relation to the lion. We can also see no presence of claws. Even in soft substrate like this, we would have thought that claws might have shown, but no claws present at all. And just the size of it would indicate that it has to be a male. There's no females that are going to have feet that big in this area. So at least we know where the tracks are. They're heading straight down this pathway, and I'm hoping they're going to go towards sort of Galago Pan. And if not Galago Pan, there's a few little drainage sections that they might be. It also gives me an excuse to go and check the hyena den of, of Mvubu one more time just to see if there's not any action with the hyenas but I think he might pop out in that particular area so that's where we're going to try and go and see if we can't find our male lion. I wonder which Birmingham it is that we have here. There's, I haven't seen too much of Tinyo lately. I've seen quite a few updates on Mfumo and on, obviously we saw Nena this week and so I haven't seen anything on Nsuko or Tinyo in the last few days so it'd be nice to see one of those. Right, now we found our lion tracks which is great news and I wonder if Byron has had any luck with his leopard tracks. So Tristan, I found those leopard tracks again of that female that was heading north but then I don't know, it does, it, they kind of disappear. Um, I couldn't see exactly which direction they went, which is a bit worrying, but, um, but I'll have a look. Um, we're just circling these areas, checking the roads very, very carefully, and that's sometimes what you've got to do. But the, a small leopard track, a young female leopard track, the tracks are very small, and also 
this it's, it's difficult at times I'll be honest it's very difficult to see the tracks while we're driving around and also with a lot of vehicles moving through the area they could have driven over tracks so it's not always easy but I'm gonna give it a try and see if we can't find her maybe she headed towards one of the dams treehouse dam perhaps maybe I'm hoping possibly lying in that area so I'm just driving very very slowly at the moment just scanning the tops of termite mounds um, and I say that because the, uh, leopards in general and again you never you should never just assume that they all do the same but but leopards do like to lie on top of a termite mound from time to time it gives them a bit of a vantage point to have a look around for potential prey especially on a cool day like this they don't necessarily have to lie in the shade or under um, under some scrub it's very cool so they wouldn't get hot if they were lying out in the open but like I say you should never just assume I would love to find a leopard laying in a tree somewhere. That would be first prize. Now, Milton, you asked how many kilometers we usually travel during a Safari Live show. Well, Milton, it varies um, because some days we could drive out of camp and drive a kilometer and find lions and then elephant and, you know, anything really. Um, other days it could be 10 to 15 kilometers. Uh, it all depends. I think uh, the longest we'd probably travel, the furthest we'd probably travel at the moment um yeah on Juma I would say is probably about 15 20 kilometers I would say is probably the furthest step of travel or well, maybe a bit more maybe maybe we could push it to about to, to about 25 Ks if we're driving from one side of the property to the other um, and driving regularly. Well, stick with me for a moment. I'm just going to jump off the vehicle here. Um, let me just jump off. Now, what I'm doing is an area like this is quite a nice little section to check for um, for potential tracks of animals coming through. It's, uh, it's quite a big junction in the roads. Now, we know that some of the predators, when they do move around, they like to cross roads um, or use the roads as prominent pathways. Now the reason they do that is just because there's less vegetation so it's a bit easier for them to move around. So um, I'm just having a quick look around here to see if we can find any fresh tracks of a leopard coming through this area. Or anything really. Maybe fresh uh, elephant tracks or... Just trying to have a look there. Oh, some elephant tracks over here. They don't look particularly fresh though. Um, doesn't look like we're having any luck at the moment also don't forget you should never just jump off a vehicle when you are tracking or um, always have a look around scan the area because there could be animals in this potential vicinity now, I can hear ox peckers actually Now they're calling in that direction. So the ox peckers are usually a good sign that there might be some animals. So let's test that. I've heard the ox peckers on the other side. I can't see anything there. Let's quickly go and have a look. They could be sitting in a tree. But let's go and have a look and see if there isn't an animal there. So stick with me. Let's just drive across and test this theory quick. Um, but usually the usually the um, ox peckers are a good indicator. Now it could be anything. It could be a buffalo. But it could also just be impala or a kudu, maybe giraffe, a zebra. They sit on a number of different animals. Carly, you said you'd love to see one of the Birmingham males and Tino or Mfumo, yeah. Would be great to see one of those males. We heard them calling last night, but we couldn't find them this morning. We didn't have much luck with tracks of the 
um, of the mail lines this morning. Let me see if I can find anything that these ox pickers may have been sitting on. Let's see. See, there's a little road. This looks like a new road that they've made through here. Uh, now, were the ox pickers just sitting in a tree somewhere? Maybe they've got a nest in this area. Just listening out to see if I can hear them again. I can't hear those ox pickers. Let's just check a little bit further through here. So as I said, sometimes the ox pickers could just be close to a nest and they nest up in trees. Carter, and 13 years old, Carter, hi Carter, nice to have you with us on Safari Live. You asked how many species of oxpecker do we have here? So we only have two Carter, the red-billed oxpecker and the yellow-billed oxpecker. And I'm sure I don't have to explain to you why they're called the red-billed and the yellow-billed. Um, now the yellow-billed is actually quite rare, we don't see them often. Their numbers are far fewer than the red-billed oxpecker. But, um, but we do get both species out here in the Greater Kruger and sometimes, and we've seen yellow build on Safari Live before, I've definitely seen them. It's always nice to see them because you see so few of them. Um, they're a little bit bigger, their beaks a little bit bigger than the red bulldog specker. Uh, I just want to have a look, I think these ox peckers were just sitting in the trees somewhere. I don't think they had any animals around, which they do from time to time. They'll just rest up in the trees, um, close to a nest probably. Uh, well, it looks like there's no animals around here. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Christian. Uh, I, uh, Chantal, can you just uh, repeat that question, please? How large is what? Uh, Christian, you asked how large Juma is. Now I'm trying to think. Um, Christian, I actually don't know. We'll have to ask Tristan that question. I'm not sure exactly the size now of Juma. I know the size of all <laughs> some of the other areas and that, but I don't know exactly what Juma is. So I don't want to give you the, the incorrect uh, size. Um, yeah, so I'm not uh, I'm not sure now. Tristan's just trying to follow up on those lion tracks. He's off the vehicle at the moment. Uh, Christian, I'm not sure. It's it's. Yeah, it's not very it's not very big in the uh, compared to some of the other properties uh, within the Sabi Sands. Um, some are a few thousand hectares. I think Juma. Yeah, I actually don't know. I'm not even going to hazard a guess. I uh, will. Um, we'll ask. We'll ask Tristan. He may know. He may have an idea exactly of how big Juma is. Uh, Riti, my favorite bird is the Marshall Eagle. Now we've seen them a few times on here and that is my favorite bird and I really enjoy seeing those Marshall Eagles but I also enjoy the little black crowned Chagras. They've got a wonderful call. I enjoy some of the little owls, the fiery necked nightjar, the scops owl and the pearl spotted owl. I love all those birds. Um, what else do I really enjoy? Um, Batelier. Batelier is a lovely bird too. Uh, the cuckoos, I enjoy the cuckoos. So I, I really enjoy a lot of different birds. But um, but yeah, the Marshall Eagle has to be my favorite. Uh, 
Now again, just looking very, very carefully while we're driving along here. I'm not sure if this leopard would have come into this area, but I'm taking a chance seeing maybe, maybe we have some luck. It's been a bit frustrating the last few days, but that's, you know, that's the thing. These animals, the movement of animals, you can never be sure where they're going to go, where they're going to be. Um, and, um, but it's one of those things, really. Craig, do you spot anything? <laughs> um, no. It's uh, Craig's use of words for the day. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> All right, now it sounds like Tristan's back on his vehicle. Let's go and find out, firstly, how his line tracking is coming along, and secondly, if he's got an answer to your question, Christian, about how big Juma is. Well, first off, the line tracking, a mm, little slow at the moment. We're just checking around the old hyena den, which is on my right-hand side over there, and I checked very nicely around there for any signs of footprints for the hyenas, but... Nothing in that area. It looks as though it hasn't been used for a very long time. So you can see the den is just tucked away in that section there. So that's the sort of den site that we always talk about on Mvubu. But it's you can see lots of leaf litter there. It hasn't been maintained and is not being used at the moment. Now our male line was on the sort of western side of the drainage that's running on my west at the moment and so I was just looking around and something ran from me but I couldn't see what it was and I didn't really get any sort of vocalizing of a, ma of a lion growling or anything like that so I don't think it was that male lion but I know there's other guys in the area that are going to try and maybe drop their trackers off and hopefully they'll be able to follow those tracks in here and just see where they go. It's a very difficult place this because there's lots of very deep gullies as we know the Inkumas used to spend time here and it's not a place that you can follow very easily so hopefully they'll be somewhere close by and somewhere where we can actually see where he's gone. In terms of the size of Juma, now the second part of what Byron was asking. In terms of the size of Juma, I'm not 100% sure on the exact hectareage or acreage of Juma itself, but I would imagine, I think I remember Brent, Brent has told me once, but I can't remember exact size, but I think it's about, I'm just trying to scratch my brains now with all of these property sizes but I think it was somewhere around two and a half thousand hectares or five thousand acres somewhere around there and then Chitwa is about 480 so Chitwa is quite small in comparison but it is all just centered around that dam and is very very popular that dam so um, in total we could say three thousand hectares or six thousand acres between the two I think that's about right but maybe Brent will be out in the Mara this afternoon and we can ask him he'll be able to tell us he's Brent has always got this mind for inquiring about things like this he likes to know the area that he's in and the size and the substrates of the soil and which is fantastic it's always nice to be around him because it's so infectious and you really want to find out things and you want to know things and so it's always good when he's around he's like I say quite a character and obviously he brings a lot of joy into all of our lives so Hopefully he'll be able to shed a bit more light. I just want to see now. No sign of any tracks this side. Okay, well let's carry on down in Vubu. And I just wanted to find out if maybe some of you were watching the damn cam last night. If perhaps at some point a male lion may have crossed around there or was around, seen around in that area. Because we can't find any further tracks to the south but these tracks apparently tax was telling me that they were driven over this morning on the Bifflesook boundary now I'm not sure what route Byron took this morning but I don't think he was up near there so it means that maybe the anti-poaching unit drove over it and so it's difficult to get a sort of time frame as to when these were they look quite good I mean already this afternoon they would have aged quite a bit from this morning and there's been a bit of a wind blowing and you know we've had a bit of rain around so it's difficult though in that regard So, Dev, I think it is, or Nev, which one there, Chantal, Dev or Nev, D or N? D, Dev, you want to know 
whether or not the animals cross boundaries in Juma. Well, most certainly this morning we were following Tingana and he crossed the boundary. We unfortunately had to let him go because he went over our southern boundary. You'll find the Birminghams are in and out every day. The Inkuhumas are in and out all the time. So there really is a lot of movement over the boundaries. The animals are not like us. They don't know what a boundary is unless there's a physical obstruction or a chemical obstruction which would be in the form of another of that species laying down a territorial marking. Otherwise they don't really care. They just move around wherever they want wherever there's food wherever there's water and they'll move around in those regards they haven't seen okay on the map that this is a cut line for Juma and they may not cross it so they just know where their areas are and they'll move then accordingly so they most certainly don't follow any of the lines that we do it just so happens that a lot of the time certain roads get utilized and certain boundary roads get kind of used as a de territorial divide and the reason for that is because you'll have a situation where the roads that are divides between varying places generally are very large and therefore are easy to, nav to navigate and they'll move around and they'll be able to scent mark they'll be able to do all of these things and it'll be really a nice easy place to patrol and they won't get ticks on them and they'll be able to then use that as a boundary so you'll find that boundaries do form part of a territory but it's only because of the actual structure of it not because it's a physical boundary for us or the animals i stopped now because i saw a dwarf mongoose bounding away but i don't see any others sometimes when you just stop a little bit then they start to come out but he just went behind that stump oh there it is there's one right there down down ferg down there we go so one just came bounding out of the grass. There's our little dwarf mongoose friends. And they'll be out and about. We were talking about it this morning that they've been a bit shy lately. And that's because of the weather conditions we've had. We've had horrible, cold, windy conditions. With So for a small dwarf mongoose like this, they get very cold very quickly. And so they'd rather go and hide out in their nice termite mounds that are insulated. And a place where they can then spend a lot of time and stay nice and warm. Now that it's warmed up a lot this afternoon... It allows them to then start moving around and actually feeding. And we'll see a lot more activity from these guys this afternoon. Not that this one is particularly active at all. It's just sort of watching and taking it very easy. I suppose it is a Monday afternoon. We've got to get into the work week. We can't just go charging forward. It's got to be slow and steady as we wind up into work. So Andresia, you say, oh, cuteness. Well, they are very cute things, aren't they? I always love dwarf mongoose, and particularly when they start interacting with one another, when they're try, sort of playing and fighting and wrestling, they're very, very cute. And sometimes you'll even find them in the early mornings when they're sitting on their mound there, because they often use termite mounds, and they'll sit there and there'll be bits of yawning and they sun themselves. They really are very cute little animals and a lot of people think that they are related to rats they are not they're in their own family altogether so they are not a rat they might be small and they might sort of run around and have tails much like rats but they most definitely are not a rat they're a small mammal and in fact are our smallest carnivore that we get in this area so very good to see right our dwarf mongoose has disappeared onward and forward we go come on male lion I feel like our male lion might have to be one of those adventures for later when it gets a little bit darker and maybe, just maybe, he decides to let out a bit of a call and that will help us to be able to find him. So I think that's what we're going to probably do. I'll do another loop around just in case, but if we get no luck, then what I'm going to do is probably come back here a little bit later and abandon our search for now. But while we do that, let's go across to Byron and see how he's doing and whether or not little Shongololo is actually starting to play her part or if Byron's still getting frustrated at the leopard tracks. I've got nothing Tristan, absolutely nothing. I have driven around that area, I've been back to the same spot where I've had the tracks three times now seen the track but I can't see where they go from there they, there's uh, been a lot of vehicle activity in that area so I don't know um, which direction she went I can't uh, can't work it out at all I've seen some uh, monkey tracks in the area so that's also not a not necessarily a bad sign it just means that it's unlikely she would have been in that area we will come check around there a little bit later but there's no sign of her at the moment I it's um, <sighs> 
was tough. <laughs> well, I had a look, but uh, as I said, it's no no sign of it. So we'll see. I'm going to head down towards Chitra Dam. Maybe we have some luck around there with animals. To my little girlfriend Tula Ann. Hello, Tula Ann. Now, Tula Ann's age five. Um, it was her birthday the other day, her and her brother's birthday the other day. Now, Tula Ann, you asked if we can put a swing up at uh, the camp or is it too scary with all the animals? Um, Tula Ann, we could probably put a swing up in the camp. Um, and uh, yeah, we could probably probably put one up. I'm sure we could. It wouldn't be a problem because the animals don't really come close to our camp during the day when we are all around there. At night, yes, the animals come to the camp and walk past the camp or get quite close to the camp. Sometimes we have hyenas in the camp, but um, but I would say like during the day, oh, we could definitely put a swing up somewhere and and swing. I really like swings. I used to. In, uh, in, I used to really like swings. Don't know if I'd fit on a swing now. <laughs> so, Tula Anna, I hope you had a lovely weekend too, and it's a start to a new week. And um, I need you to send us good luck so we can try and find some animals because I haven't had much luck recently a little bit we found the lions the other day but the last two days I've been struggling to find any cats Tristan had luck this morning with Tingana he saw a big male leopard Tingana but we'll try our best this afternoon and see what we can come up with now uh, Uh, Monique, you asked if we have rats here. We do, Monique, we do. We do get rats. And uh, there is a species of rat that does occur in this area called a cane rat. It's massive. <laughs> it's a huge rat. It's about this big. Some of the cane rats get to about that big. Um, so if you don't like rats, it's not ideal. I've never seen one actually here, but I do know you do get an area that occur. Um, we have little rodents and which occur around here. We've got elephant shrews, we've got mice, striped field mice, um, but there are there are rats that occur around here and I think there's also an, uh, an acacia rat that also occurs in this area. So yes, we do indeed have rats. You know what? Sorry, I've just got a feeling. Let's just have a look at this little water hole behind us. Twin dams. Keep our eyes peeled for a leopard lying close to the water. Now, usually in summer, this works a little bit better because it is quite hot and the animals do come down and drink. And some of the predators do lay close to water holes from time to time. Now, we found these young leopards, uh, Shungile and Osana, in this area a number of times. They two young leopards who, who are offspring of a very well-known leopard in this area, known as Karula. She, uh, unfortunately, has disappeared. Not exactly sure what happened to her. But I'm just having a look around here. This is an ideal spot for a leopard to hide. We need all the other animals to give us a hand. They need to start alarm calling at predators so we can find them. Uh, 
and we have found an impala. <laughs> there we go, it's actually going down to drink. Now let's just have a look, this is interesting, watch how cautious this impala is. Constantly looking around. They're always very nervous when they go down to the water, even though they're... Just, I don't think there's a crocodile in there. see how nervous they are and it's because they know that when their heads are down they're also a lot more vulnerable to potential prey I mean to potential predators but you'll see how they um Let's see they may drink a little bit then lift, lift their head and look around let's just see what this impala does No, he actually seems... Oh, there we go. You see, step back. Quick little drink of water, not too long, and then off he goes again. See, so really as quickly as possible, a drink and then move away. Now, there was another male that just moved off behind him, um, off to the left. And so I wonder if they realize... And I think... Um, I think often what happens is these animals will keep a lookout for one another. So one might go and drink and the other one might hang around and just keep a lookout for potential danger and then the other one will go and drink. So there's always someone looking out for predators. Now speaking of predators, let's see if Tristan is a predator on the tracks. Can he find the, us a lion? Well, we're trying our very best, Byron, but it seems our male lion is stuck somewhere in these deep drainage sections between Gallagher's Shortcut and Mvubu. And, well, without being on foot and having to walk through there, I think we're going to really struggle to find him. He doesn't seem to be lying anywhere near a road. Certainly no tracks coming out that we can see anywhere in these areas. And so I would imagine that he's just lying up somewhere inside all of this. Now hopefully, I think Herbie's going to come and give us a hand and take a little walk through there and see if he can't help us find this male lion. So maybe a little bit later we'll be lucky. So in the meantime, I think I'm going to head off towards Buffelshook Dam and just go and try and see if there's not anything lurking around the dam that may be having a little drink now that it's a bit warmer. I'll hopefully find the elephants coming out and sort of going that way to ease the thirst that they potentially have. But other than that, it's been very quiet. There's been a few oxpeckers calling here and there, but no signs of really anything since we saw our kudu. I don't think we've seen another animal, have we, Ferg? Impala, we did see. Ah. Jules, you're wondering if we have any flightless bird species here in Juma. Well, yes, we do. We have one, and it is called an ostrich. It is the biggest bird that we get in Africa and it is a massive individual and we don't see them very often but they do potentially occur here. In fact the last time I saw tracks for an ostrich was on Cheetah Cutline going southwards. Now on Cheetah Plains every now and then we used to see them but here on Juma a little bit too dense for them but every now and then you might see one coming down Cheetah Cutline that area and then moving down towards Cheetah Plains. So we do get them in this area and that's the biggest and largest and only flightless bird that I know of in this section of the world. Be cool to see an ostrich again. I wouldn't mind seeing an ostrich. I quite like ostriches. They uh, sometimes can be a little bit on the sort of simple side when you watch them and the way, the way they, they move about. But I always think they're really quite amazing birds. If you think that they're able to run at the speeds that they run, they can really get going. And then they've got that nasty kick that they use to defend themselves. Very, very cool to see. Just, just, just no birds even though talking about birds I was just trying to see if I can see if there's any birds in the trees but no nothing that I can see at this stage hmm so 
Mita, who's eight years old. Hello, Mita. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Now, Chantal, I missed the little part. I only heard friends in the Mara, and I think you said, do you miss my friends in the Mara? Yes, there we go. So I did hear, right? I should have trusted myself. Well, Mita, of course I do. I have, my friends in the Mara are some of my very best friends. Jamie and Brent are two friends that I've even stayed with for long periods of time so I went and had a sleep over there for a long time and we ended up staying for over a month with them so I know Jamie and Brent very well and they are some of my best friends and so I do miss them a lot both Ali and I do miss them and then also James and Kirsty and Rebecca and Lou and Jerry and Wildebeest well that's Viam if you don't know that he's called a Vildi they're all our some of our very best friends and so the whole crew up there Dave Senzo Alex all of them are very sorely missed by us all and it actually is quite sad sometimes because we do miss our friends but then we phone them and we have a chat on the phone and it's all quite festive and now we even have a group on our cell phones on WhatsApp which is a little sort of communication device uh, set up and we all talk to each other every single day and lots of laughs are had and lots of jokes are shared and so I, while I do miss them at least I know that they're having lots of fun there and they are really having a good time and they are going to bring us some amazing things and we will see them quite soon it's only about three months until we we'll probably see some of them again and so it's not so bad and sometimes as they say absence makes the heart grow fonder which means people that are away when you they're not here your heart starts to miss them and then you start to feel more um, love towards them and therefore it's a good thing sometimes so Ferg do you miss our friends from we do, very much. indeed we do we all do because it's a lot quieter here it's not as loud and as busy and as fun as it used to be it used to be quite chaotic at one point when especially just before everyone went to the Mara we were quite a big crew at that stage and it was lots of fun but Hopefully, like I say, it's all in a good for a good cause and in time we'll all mix and match again and it'll become just like normal and we'll have fun and luckily we have a really nice bunch of friends here that we can hang around with and so it's all not too bad. Hmm, still no sign of our lion though, Mila. We, our lion's being very, very naughty. So we're going to have to have a word with our lion as well. Hopefully our lion misses us as much as we miss our friends in the Mara and will come out and show itself just now. But I think onward and forward to water is going to be our best bet. Yeah, we may be going to get lucky if we go to water. It's that time of the day where it's quite warm and so it's the best time for an animal to go and drink, particularly the animals that are active during the day. And so I'm thinking that maybe, just maybe, Buffalzook Dam is going to have a secret for us and a surprise and we get lucky when we go there. Of course, nobody's been anywhere near Buffalzook Dam this afternoon, so I could be completely wrong, but I'm just throwing it out in the hope that the What's that on top of the termite mound there? It's not very big whatever it is, but there is something sitting on top of the termite mound. Is it just a stump or is it a whole bunch of dwarf mongoose? I think it's a whole bunch of dwarf mongoose all packed together and they looked much bigger than what they really are. Yes, indeed it is. So just on our mound over there, there you can see them, all packed on top of the mound. So I thought that they, they were kind of lying all together in one big clump and it looked like a big brown object and I was wondering if maybe it was a slender mongoose or, may, or maybe something bigger than that. And you've always got to stop when you see something that you don't really know what it is. Stop and make double sure and that's how you find a lot of the animals out here. And in fact all the best trackers I've worked with have always told me don't look for animals, don't go and look for a leopard or look for a lion look for changes in the bush that don't seem right and look for colors that don't seem right and when you see something like that then stop and check and you'll find that most of the time your eyes and your brain are so good that they realize that there's something out of place and you stop and you'll spot something that is there so it's a good lesson to learn and maybe we can hijack Byron's tip of the day and that is to look for changes in color and shapes and not just look for animals themselves but you can see they're busy grooming having quite a bit of fun on top of the mound. I would imagine they're loving this warmer weather. Let's see if we're going to get into a wrestling match, because sometimes they will. They'll go back on their back legs and push one another around. Although on top of a termite mound, I think they behave a little bit more, because otherwise it's going to end up in a tumble down the mound. And that particular mound is quite tall. I don't think they'd want to be falling down that mound at all. That was cool, though. Nice to see you guys. 
It's getting to the time of the day, unfortunately, where they're going to have to start going to bed because as the sun gets lower, and particularly on a cloudy day like we've got now, it's going to get dark a bit earlier than normal. And so you're going to find these guys will start making their way towards their mounds and they'll feed a little bit around the mounds, but most of their activity is going to be very locally based. And then as soon as it starts getting a little dark inside the mound and then for the night, they will rest. Nice. Ah, James, you want to know if the distance that a dwarf mongoose forages, will it ever change? Well, yes, James, I would imagine so, particularly, and the reason why I say this is because, again, it's what we were talking about earlier with territories that are set up and the way things work, is that most animals will require food and water. Now, if water dries up and food disappears, then dwarf mongoose, unfortunately, are going to have to try and expand their range to try and get enough food to sustain the whole group of them so you'll find that they'll then probably push a little bit further in the winter months as they look for food also remember in summer we don't have to go far to find food there's insects all over the place we just know from our bushwalks that on quarantine you can literally find an insect on almost every plant or leaf that you turn over whereas now it's very very difficult you can walk through this grass for long periods of time and not find an insect and so that means that these guys are going to have to move slightly further just to be able to get the same amount of food and that's when the territories will try shift slightly and get a little bit larger now what's this hopping down the road here that doesn't look like a normal bird that we see the motion that it's run or of the way that it's moving is a little bit different no don't go behind <laughs> now I'm gonna just try and see if I can't get around this little apex here and see what this bird was that was hopping around because it didn't look like one of the normal sort of ways that birds move. Oh no, I've spooked it. No. Oh well, it's flown away, unfortunately for me, so we're going to have to just leave it there. And while we do that, I believe Byron has had a bit more success with the feathered friends and has been able to find a rather large one. Well, it looks like our luck is changing. We've found a pair of fish eagles, not just the one and look how full that crop is that one in the front you can see that the crop is that front little section um, just on the chest that's where they store a bit of their food after they fed and that crop is very very full all the birds have it you see it quite prominently with the with the large birds of prey vultures um, and as, as well as the eagles when they fed their crop fills up and I uh, wonder what these fish eagles caught. Perhaps there rem there's remains of a fish somewhere. They are close to Chitwa Chitwa Dam and there's a lot of fish in there, a lot of catfish, or we call them barbel. It's a species of catfish. There's also probably tilapia, various species of tilapia in there. Andres, you say these are spectacular. They are indeed. I love seeing the fish eagles. Now, I just want to show you something quickly, and I find this fascinating. Is if you look just to the left, there's a um, just to our left, there's a group of guinea fowl on the ground there. Uh, can you see that? Uh, there they are. Thanks, Craig. Uh, see those guinea fowl dust bathing, chasing one another, running around. Now, uh, it's if we had, you know, I think they've just moved off there now. However, these guinea fowl came through from this area. They came through right from underneath the tree. They came past the, under those trees, came past this area and walked out into the, into the clearing. Now, why I'm pointing it out is because these guinea fowl didn't alarm call once, even though they're two potential birds of prey sitting at the top of that tree. It's amazing how these birds, the guinea fowl, know that those fish eagle probably aren't a threat at all. So the fish eagle, we know, they generally hunt fish. They, that's what they do. They'll swoop over the water and catch fish out of the water. They do occasionally feed on carrion or carcasses that are found around the water. I've seen it in Botswana a few times. Maybe something that a crocodile's fed on. Uh, they do sometimes scavenge off carcasses. However, they very seldom, and I don't know of any uh, situation where they hunt other birds for food. 
it's a possibility they do. I actually just want to read if they've got that down as, as um, a food or potential food for uh, for the um, fish eagle. But um, but it just shows you because the other day we had a martial eagle up in a tree. Now these guinea fowl, maybe, uh, maybe it was in this group, but a group of guinea fowl went ballistic. They constantly alarm called. They hid in the scrub. They tried to stay out of sight of that martial eagle. And they could all see it from a distance and they were much further away than this fish eagle is from these guinea fowl. But they alarm called non-stop to warn each other that there was a seriously dangerous bird of prey up in a tree above them. So it just shows you how intelligent the birds are as well as the animals. The animals do this too. And I'll touch on that now. But the birds clearly recognize which bird of prey they need to watch out for and which birds of prey are not a threat like these fish eagles so that is very very interesting um, see now it says um, they sometimes prey on large waterside birds so maybe something like a heron or a Egyptian goose but it's very very seldom No, um, so that is really interesting. So yeah, maybe some large waterside birds, but but it's funny that they don't, well, not necessarily guinea fowl. I don't know. I'm sure there would be an occasion where they've gone for guinea fowl, but it's not a it's not a, a serious threat. Whereas with the Marshall eagle or the African hawk eagles, guinea fowl know that those are a threat. Those birds will hunt them, so they'll alarm call and warn each other. Now, uh, Kristen, you asked if. The fish eagles swim like other birds of prey. Now, I'm trying to think what other birds of prey I've seen swimming. I've, now, I don't think it's a case of them swimming as such. Um, I think they might land in the water from time to time when they're trying to catch something, perhaps. Um, but I don't think it's a case of them swimming. Now the other bird I can think of is the osprey. They also hunt fish and they do land in the water from time to time and I suppose they struggle to get out. It's not a case of them swimming. But I don't know of a situation or a case where the, the birds of prey actually swim. So Kristen, if you can give me an example, I'm very curious about that. I don't know of any birds of prey in Africa that swim. Um, uh, they they do maybe go down and, and drink water and occasionally bathe, yes, but not swim from what I know for, or what I've seen. I've never read or seen anything about birds of prey swimming in, here in Africa. So if you have an example, please send it to us and, and let me know. I'm very curious. Now I was describing about... Now, animals also have different alarm calls or react differently to certain predators. Now, what I mean by that is, let's take an impala for example. If impala or herd of impala see a leopard or lion, they'll all alarm call and they'll move around together to almost, almost mob that predator. They'll go, they'll run, alarm call and constantly walk towards the whatever predator it is well mainly lion and leopard so that they can see where it is they don't want to lose sight of that predator because lion and leopard are ambush predators so for them they need to get really close to the impala for them to hunt them now if the impala keep an eye on them they lose the the um the uh, element of surprise so there's no chance of them hunting them however if those impalas see a group of wild dogs, a pack of wild dogs, or if they see cheetah, often I've seen with wild dogs, they sometimes they don't even alarm call. The impala just run because it happens so quickly that the wild dog just run through. They try and cause chaos, split the, the herd of impala and try and hunt one or two impala together as a pack. They'll split up. Now the impala maybe give off one alarm call but they don't stand around to alarm call at the wild dog. They know they need to get out of there quickly. So they'll run away. They don't stand. Same with cheetah. Maybe one alarm call and they're off because a cheetah will run them down. So because the the um, hunting strategy of cheetah and wild dog is so different from leopard and lion, the 
prey animals, so like the impala, they react differently to each, um, each predator. So it's very interesting. It just shows you how intelligent those animals are. They know they can recognize the different predators. Impala might not necessarily even alarm call that hyena. I've seen a hyena walk past impala and they just stand and watch them. So it just shows they definitely recognize the different predators and the danger that each predator um, has on the, on the impala, for example. Interesting. Sure, it's a lot of talking. <laughs> now, Erica, you asked, what is the most dangerous bird of prey? Now, what do you mean? Ex are you meaning, what is the most dangerous bird of prey uh, to, to us, or just in terms of hunting techniques? Um, uh, you know, it, I, I mean, I would, I would guess one of those eagles in terms of strength and power to other animals. So a martial eagle and a crowned eagle are probably the most powerful, and a black eagle. Those are most likely the most powerful eagles because they're the largest that we get to in Africa. Um, they, uh, they'll even hunt small antelope uh, if they can. Maybe a young, young impala lamb. Um, or a small steenbok, a young steenbok, or a young daker. There have been records of those eagles hunting those birds, uh, hunting those little antelope. The crowned eagle is so powerful, and they manage to hit and kill monkeys right out of trees. They'll go swoop down and hit a monkey right out of a tree and kill it or, or grab it in a tree. They're very big, very large, powerful, powerful um, birds of prey. The crowned eagle has the strongest talons and uh, the power of the, the crowned eagle is incredibly strong very very powerful more so than any of the other e um, eagles and their crushing strength the power that they have in those talons is insane it really is crazy any bird handlers if they have crowned eagles that have been injured or anything and they try to rehabilitate them they need to wear a special they need to wear a special steel cover that goes over their arm because if they don't those crowned eagles can crush the arm of a human being they really are incredibly powerful anyway speaking of something powerful brent has found some elephant up in the mara um, it is a monster elephant bull in kenya in the maasai mara uh welcome my name is Brent Dio Smith. I have Dangerous Dave Eastall on camera, and we've got one of the most majestic old gentlemen of the Mara, and we've been enjoying our time with him so far. And I know Byron just mentioned crowned eagles. I actually saw one this morning, can you believe? And fly. Oh dear, looks like we've just lost Brent again. I'm going to try reposition quickly just for these eagles. See if we can get another view of them. What a surprise. Look, there's Warthog. Ah, see. Look, our luck's changing. And if I stop here, we can also have a view of those fish eagles. But let's look at those Warthog. Let's see. Are those males or females? Look like they're both females. They are indeed both females. Now you can also tell by the face. Now if you look at the face of the warthogs, um, now these two, they're walking away from us, but the face of the warthogs, the males have got four warts on their face. Two up at the top and two lower down. I'm trying to see if I can find a picture, perhaps, in my mammal book. Let me see. But look at that one. There are only two. See close to the eye. Um, there are two large warts close to the eyes. There are two little ones, but they're not very prominent lower down. But I'll show you. The males have got four very prominent warts. Uh, oh, dear. This... Uh, this book doesn't give us very clear pictures of the warthog, unfortunately. But the reason why the males have got four and the females have two is because also the males fight a lot between uh, um, each other. 
and they've got those sharp tusks so those warts actually help protect the face and the eyes so they've got rather large warts to protect their face from those sharp tusks whereas the females only have two warts now you'll notice with these wart dogs too they've got um, very prominent white whiskers um, or beards rather you can see there it does stand out quite a bit now the reason for that is it comes across it comes across as um, uh, as large tusks so if a predator sees them they'll just get a glimpse of those big white tufts of hair and they'll think uh, it'll appear as if it's got large tusks so they'll think twice about uh, about hunt, um, hunting them Ah, oh, but now Tristan's got something rare, something we haven't seen for a while on Safari Live. And I was speaking about them this morning. Let's go have a look. Well, we have seen these guys. I think I saw them this morning as well. But we haven't seen too many this afternoon. But it's our yellow-billed hornbill friends. And they are just been on the ground sort of going through the soil. And I wonder if there wasn't a food source that they found here. You can see there's a bit of grooming going on and sometimes after they've eaten you'll find they'll go up onto a tree like this and then just clean their beak but I'm pretty sure that one's going to take off now that its partner's taken off and I tried to have a little look around where those male lion tracks were but it's still they were just heading straight to the south and towards Gallagher camp I can actually see the Vuya Telemar straight in front of where I was walking so he must be somewhere in that general vicinity to that direction which Ferg is showing you and look at those beautiful clouds that's quite pretty actually so you can see the clouds are breaking apart and blue sky is starting to come, which is a bit of a hallelujah moment, really. Very nice, Ferg. And that's not Vuya Telemast, no, that's, that's uh, Rusty's mast. The Rusty's got its antenna up, of course, otherwise you wouldn't be seeing us. Right, but let's head towards Bufuzuk Dam because we've been sort of avoiding it so far and it's now time to go and actually check there. Interestingly enough though, when I was walking, and this is a very big interesting, there was a track for a female leopard inside there as well. So who knows who that is? I have no idea. I don't know of any of female leopards that hang around in this area at the moment. And so it's just interesting that there was a track for a female there. It's very old, it wasn't recent, but it's in within the last probably, I would say two, three days that it's been there. So maybe it's worth I don't think I actually try need to get a couple camera traps up and we need to try and see what's going on here and see which leopards are walking where and try and decode all the leopards that are walking around it'd be interesting to know if there is any new visitors that are coming and passing through because we seem to follow so many different tracks and yet we kind of find our regulars normally in their normal places but there's other areas where we're finding tracks and we're not sure who they are and I would imagine that they we probably be quite surprised as to some of our leopards moving in areas that we didn't think they were doing so now I know Herbie always tells me about oh I've ruined all of these tracks which is a bit of an unfortunate situation but there was tracks here and I'll try and show you because there'll still be some of them but unfortunately you're gonna to have to ex excuse the massive tire track right through the middle now but in front you'll see there's a m big disturbance on the road so there's lines and there's well, almost looks like soil that's been thrown all over the place if you have a look it's difficult now because I've driven through it unfortunately it doesn't look quite as good as what it did maybe a little bit further up folk um, no, it doesn't look great now, but this was an area where it seems like two kudu were having a big fight because their tracks are there and the soil's all been disturbed and you can see where they were pushing up against each other, but unfortunately I drove over it and only my brain only realized a little bit later, but you can see there's some sort of disturbance in the soil there and that's from where two kudu bulls were having some sort of a scrap. Interesting. Would have been nice if there had been a big male lion track in amongst that because we could have maybe surmised something a little bit different. But I'd imagine it's the same kudu that we saw earlier because it's not too far from where I saw them. A very old buffalo dung.
Dev, you're wondering about the lionesses and whether they always lead the hunt. Well, Dev, no. Um, our male lions here in this area, unfortunately, because a lot of the time they spend time on their own, they have to lead their own hunts. They have to do their own hunting and try and find food for themselves. And so a lot of the time you'll find our male lions actually hunting um, themselves and, and doing their own thing. But when the females are around, then generally they they are the ones that kind of lead what's going on and they're the ones that will take up the front sections. The males normally will try and just sort of fit in somewhere and they really are useful when they try and take on bigger animals. So when the females take on things like buffalo, that's when the males become of vital importance. The Birmingham seem very active when it comes to hunting. I've watched them quite a few times hunting and they always seem like they take a lot of interest in the hunt and they seem to be always keen to help out and it's not always the case with male lions. I've seen other male lions that have been a little bit more lazy in that regard and they let the females kind of do what's the things and only come in when it's really sort of time to show their muscle and their strength but the Birmingham's tend to be quite proactive and of course they've hunted many times as a unit themselves and so they really are used to doing the hunting and, and that's probably why they do get involved as much as they can. It's such a nice color in one of the clouds. I'm trying to get a gap where we can actually see the cloud and hopefully a bit later we'll get more colors coming through. But that cloud over there, Ferg, you see it's got interesting colors, doesn't it? You can see now where the front is leaving us and these trailing clouds behind it. And those are all those puffy clouds. And towards down towards the horizon is a pinkish colored cloud that's developing just on that sort of side. It's not quite got the color yet, but slowly but surely it's turning more and more pink as the afternoon is waning on and we're starting to see more colors coming through. But very happy to see the back of those clouds, aren't you, folk? Ooh. It's been an unpleasant two days with the wind and the cold. So nice to see some blue skies again. And I'm always, I'm always up for a bit of rain, but not when it's accompanied by very cold weather and gusting, howling winds. Andresia, are you saying it's a wonderful day on drive? Well, I couldn't agree more with you, Andresia. It's a beautiful afternoon. It's actually perfect conditions to be out here. Like I say, there's not a breath of wind. If you look at the grass in front of me, you can see, compared to the last few days where this grass was flapping about, it's almost dead still. There is a nice temperature. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. A little bit of a cloud cover, so the sun is not too bright. And it's actually a very pleasant afternoon to be out here. And it will be even more pleasant once we find our Birmingham mail. So I'm going to cling on to hope and I'm pretty sure we will find it at some point. It's just going to take a bit of perseverance and we'll have to probably wait until it gets a bit dark and hope that he then vocalizes and he'll then come out and we'll be able to find him. But I wonder where those tracks for Shongile went as well. <laughs> so Argob, oh you're wondering why there's speed bumps on all the roads. Well, Argob, there aren't speed bumps. They are called mitre drains and bolsters is what the name is for them. And they're not designed to slow people down. And we've got a perfect example of one up in front here. So I'm going to stop here and explain the system to you. But basically you can see there is an raised section of the road just here in front if I come to a sandstill so that Ferg can balance the camera out. But there's a raised section that goes up. Now what's happened there is they've purposely put that in place because we're now going on a down slope and therefore runoff of rain is going to start f running down the road. Remember water travels on a path of least resistance and so roads actually almost become like riverbeds and so you get a huge amount of water flowing on the roads and that's bad for two reasons. One is our roads are not going to be able to stay in good condition. They're beginning to erode very, very quickly because remember they develop a hard cap on the top. And so you cut a section into the bush as Ferg is showing you there. And what happens is the rain hits this big bump or well, the water flowing down the road hits this big bump and then gets pushed back into the bush where it's needed, where it belongs and also keeps our roads in very good condition. So you'll find on steep slopes far more of these bumps going over and up and down to try and slow that rate of water down so very clever idea and of course the other side of the fact is that it does just slow traffic down a little bit or vehicles down which is also not a bad thing at all so the actual drain is called the mitre drain and then the bump itself is called a bolster
So there we go. That's it. Now I'm going to try and negotiate Gremlin Hollow, which is coming up in front of me. And so I do apologize if there is one or two little breakups in picture. In fact, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go to the left and round because the left, the Gremlins, that's the outskirts of Gremlinville. That's the deep center. You don't want to go. That's the CBD over there. So we don't want to go that way. We're going to go around the outskirts and through the sort of fringes of the city of Gremlins and try and avoid them as much as possible. Let's see how we go. Ferg, I reckon we're in for a stunning sunset. These clouds are going to be fantastic. Hopefully we'll have a male lion accompanying it, but even if we don't, we're going to have a wonderful sunset. These broken clouds always are so pretty when you get the nice light on them. And I'm just trying to see on our western horizon, but it looks like the cloud has lifted enough that the sun is going to be underneath. Isn't that pretty as we go through the outskirts of Gremlin, the outskirts of Gremlinville? Gremlins have got a good view today, that's for sure. Hopefully they don't come dive bombing onto us quickly race through there we go ah we escaped gremlins today well done high five Ferg Ferg you're leaving me hanging there we go <laughs> so at the end of the day one has to make some sort of tale about our gremlins they're such a big part of our show sometimes that I feel like we should tell the story of their lives and their little communities that they have and Maybe we should start giving the communities names as to where they are, because there's, that is what we'll call, let's see, what can we call that? It's Gauri Cutline there, so it can be Gauri Hollow. That's where those gremlins live, are in Gauri Hollow. And then we've got Mulawati, so Mulawati Metropolis is the other one that we've got. Mulawanini, ooh, I don't know, I'll have to think about that one. Uh, where else have we got bad ones? Mulawati is the biggest one. That one runs far and long. Mm, Biffleshook Boundary has got a few. So around Sydney's Dam. Well, we can just call that Sydney and we'll just use that as where the gremlins live. And maybe we can build some sails there. Now, I believe <laughs> as we're talking about gremlins and them causing trouble, Byron is busy trying to ward them off and trying to actually keep them off, but is failing miserably. Don't worry, Byron. Just remember, sh flash your guns. Gremlins don't like a bicep, particularly a bicep the size of Byron's, and so you should be fine, Byron, if you flash some guns. Also, you can tell Craig just to get his cape out, and gremlins will go scurrying in fear of the Batman that's going to swoop down upon them and chase them away, and that should work. Hmm. Well, still very few signs of animals out this side of the world. Very quiet. There sounds like quite a few herds of elephants that are coming in from Kruger, Manuleti, down on the sort of boundaries of those two areas, which is, bodes well for us for tomorrow. It's not quite time yet for them to get here, but if we are starting to hear about elephants coming from those areas, then that does bode well for tomorrow's morning and tomorrow afternoon's drives. The Ellie should start coming down into this area. Right, now I believe Byron flashed his guns, gremlins scattered all into Chitwa Dam and they are busy sort of vanquishing out of that area and swimming across the dam hoping that Vlad doesn't get them. So let's go back to him and see how he's doing. <laughs> 